Okay, so okay, it's time. So let me start the economic session. So I'm Ipe Fujiwara, professor of macroeconomics at the Crawford School of Public Policy at ANU and the Faculty of Economics at the Keio University in Tokyo. So the, my background is a fake, I'm in Tokyo. And uh, many of you are joining us from across Australia, and uh, this is the joint event by the Australian, Australia Japan Research Center and the Center for Applied Macroeconomic Analysis, that is the AJLC and the Kama of the ANU. Therefore, first, I want to acknowledge and to celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands each of us meet, and I pay my respect to elders, past and the present. Okay, so let me start the session. Today, we are really fortunate to have two truly distinguished, prominent, and the respected speakers. I want to use as many praising words as possible at this economic session. The first speaker is a professor, professor Toshitaka Sekine at the Hitotsubashi University. Toshi was the Director General of the Research and the Statistics Department of the Bank of Japan from 2015 and 2019. Therefore, very well known as the Chief Economist of the Bank of Japan. I had the privilege to work under Toshi's dictator, director, not dictator, I'm sorry, di directorship while I was at the Bank of Japan. So, so that's a, no, no, it's directorship. So that I can say without any hesitation that the Toshi is the best of us I have ever had in my whole life. I feel like I'm saying the same thing every year when I have a former boss as a speaker, but that this time it is the most true or truest and honestly, the most honestly. And uh, if you have any question on the Japanese economy, Toshi is a very right person with 33 years of experiences as the central bank economist at the Bank of Japan. And the Toshi received the DPhil in economics from Oxford University. And the second speaker is the Professor Sagiri Kitao at the University of Tokyo. Sagiri is the most active and the best researcher on macroeconomics in Japan. Sagiri received a PhD in economics at the New York University with the supervision by Thomas Sargent, Nobel laureates in economics in 2011. Upon her completion of the PhD study, Sagiri started working as the assistant professor at the University of Southern California. Then she continued to work in a prominent institutions, uh, Federal Reserve Bank of New York, City University of New York, Keio University, where I am now, and I had the privilege to work with her and now at the University of Tokyo. And this, Sagiri is the recipient of the Nakahara Prize of the Japanese Economic Association at the award given to the best economists under the age of 45 in 2016. So in, uh, about the scheme of today's session, we will have the presentation first by Toshi and then by Sagiri. If you have any questions, please post them on the uh, question features. And then uh, Sagiri and the Toshi will answer to your questions after all their presentations. Okay, so without further ado, I would like to welcome Toshi as the first speaker of this economic session. Toshi, are you ready? Okay, let me just share my slide first. Is it okay? Uh, so yes, I can see. Yep. Then, uh, first of all, thank you, Ipe. Um, and let me express my uh, gratitude to the organizer for inviting me, inviting me to, to this webinar. Um, in fact, uh, this is my second time to participate in Japan Update. Uh, three years ago, I came to Canberra, and after that, even to Perth for, uh, for a follow-up session. I really had a good time then, uh, including having discussion with Professor Drysdale and Ciro, among others. At that time, that so uh, I made a presentation on importance of maintaining a high-pressure status of the Japan's economy, which appeared to, to raise the productivity but dampen inflation. Then I argued that raising productivity could be more important than achieving 2% inflation, given the headwind of the demographic factors in Japan. And at the end of the day, uh, I also argue that so high pressure economy uh, would lift inflation, although it would take quite some time. I must say that so how different things turn out. At that time, I never imagined a pandemic shock of COVID-19 that hit the global economy so severely. 
Uh, today, I will talk about this new reality. Uh, my presentation is divided into two parts. First, I will go uh, through very quickly how Japan's economy looks like now after the pandemic broke out. Then I will discuss some policy implications. Okay, uh, then the first part of my presentation, how Japan's economy looks like. I will start with the figure that I am sure that's almost you, all of you are familiar with. Uh, these are chart of a uh, number of infected uh, with COVID-19. And the left-hand side panel is seven days increase and the right-hand side panel is cumulative number. And this vertical axis, which must be smaller uh, in, in, in the later, that's so, which is the case of one million of population. And if you look at the left-hand side panel, Japan and Japan is this green line, and Australia is this so, uh, line here, uh, looks quite similar. Both had a second wave during the summer, and they seem to have picked out. And in cumulative, uh, in this set slide, um, 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 they seem in cumulative number, Japan is located below Australia, which implies that Japanese is less infected. However, of course, these numbers are also subject to how proactively our uh, government provide virus tests. And the second figure is this tall here, this, uh, which again, I'm pretty sure that you are quite familiar with. Um, on your left-hand side panel, uh, and perhaps because of the time run, there is no distinct so, uh, peak out as yet, uh, either for Australia nor Japan. In cumulative terms, that's, uh, that this date, uh, uh, 10 per uh, 1 million, this is 10 here in Japan, in the case of Japan, uh, uh, 10 per 1 million means that so 0.001% is the death rate for Japan. And if you go to the Australia, uh, it is 0.003%. Both of them are quite low compared with that of Spanish influenza, uh, compared with number of which is 2.1% according to the Barrow's estimate. Uh, presumably because of the medical advance and the proactive lockdown measures and so on, at least so far, COVID-19 seems to, to have less damage than Spanish influenza in terms of the human lives. That said, uh, that is not without economic cost. Um, here. I think that so, uh, Australia is the same, but real GDP uh, of all of, of this so, advanced economy plunge more than what we have experienced, we experienced after the, the, the great financial crisis in 2008 or something like this. In case of Japan, uh, if you go to the left-hand side panel, uh, the real GDP shrank in Q4 last year due to the hike of the consumption tax. In Q2 this year, uh, main driver of sharp contraction, some sharp contraction are export and consumptions. Let me follow uh, up how these two items are likely to, to evolve in Q3 by uh, seeing that monthly indicator. First, export. On the right left hand side panel, monthly real export index, uh, the latest so number here is July, this one is July, uh, appear to bottom out, although its level is still far below that of before the COVID-19. Uh, by destination, uh, if you see that on the right hand side panel, export to China, uh, which is uh, this so greenery line, uh, continue to, 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 to rise or continue to increase. Uh, and, uh, and presumably reflecting that those of automobile export to the United States recovered in July after 50% drop uh, at the worst. So, so if you see that the so right hand panel, that the United States go, the export become hard in a sense and go up so in uh, recent months. And uh, if we further go to the consumption side, uh, monthly consumption index stop declining uh, and show some recovery. This zigzag here, uh, which is uh, most so, uh, distinctive, distinctive for durable consumption, reflects the hike of the consumption tax. 
after that it plunged like this and uh, uh, and 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 it increased in june although it softened somewhat in july maybe due to the second wave and the, the level again far below that before the consumption tax hike service consumption which is here uh, and remains particularly weak behind this consumption activity what about labor market condition the unemployment rate which is this uh, line here uh hf in july but its level is still quite below uh, that after the great financial crisis but if we add that those who take leaves to an unemployed uh, which is this dash line, uh, the spike, uh, the rate spike, just like the unemployment rate, which are uh, observed in the United States. And it declined in July, all of it still higher than the, that before the COVID-19. Um, and uh, these number, uh, I need to, to, to add that, so uh, these figures hide heterogeneity behind it, uh, which is, I believe, that's the subject of the Professor Kitao's presentation. Uh, all in all, this quick review, review that Japan's economy contracted enormously during the lockdown period of COVID-19. Uh, after these measures were lifted, the economy stopped declining and recovered somewhat. Although the activity level is still quite low compared with that before the pandemic and there is still a risk of double or triple dips, depending on the third or fourth wave or something like this. And the active monetary and fiscal policy certainly support this development. If you look at the central bank balance sheet of the major so, uh, economy, advanced economy, uh, these central banks balance it well uh, because of the various measures uh, taken uh, after the COVID-19. But if you look at the, in case of the Bank of Japan, uh, its balance sheet expanded rapidly after the 2013, April 2013, uh, because it, we, uh, the Bank of Japan launched the, uh, the Abenomics uh, um, uh, at that time. And uh, at the same time, that, so if you go to the right-hand side of one um, the fund IMF estimate government deficit will increase dramatically for all these economies. Uh, that is the first part of my presentation, uh, and uh, let's move on to the policy uh, strategy in the era of the COVID-19. And, uh, and the first thing uh, I, I wanted to mention here is I think it is useful to divide uh, this policy strategy to, to, to four stages. Uh, the first stage is lockdown period. Uh, during this period, we prioritize people's lives so as to prevent the catastrophic disaster. We need to, to provide, and we did in fact, uh, ample liquidity in order to sustain the economy. And the second stage here is post lockdown period, but before the vaccine is de deployed. At this stage, that's so also it cannot fully stimulate the economy because if we did this, uh, if the, they did too much, infection of the COVID-19 would rise again. Instead of demand stimulus, we might need to, to take some solvency measures, which I will come back soon. And the third stage uh, correspond to the period after the vaccine or drug against COVID-19 is deployed. That allows the authority to stimulate economy fully without risking uh, another surge of the COVID-19. Then lastly, uh, we can normalize policy measures, although I do not know how long it takes to, to, to reach this stage. At the beginning of the COVID-19 era, say in February or March this year, I used to think uh, two stages, lockdown period and post-lockdown period, and predicted that V-shaped recovery. However, it became obvious that we need to, to take account of the distinction between pre- and post-vaccine period. And we are at the second stage right now. And specific to this stage, I would like you to argue that three issues, uh, namely, uh, probability of moving from liquidity problem to solvency problem. And second is deflation or inflation to come. And third, 
uh, importance of the leading potential growth and the natural rate of interest rate. Uh, then liquidity versus solvency measures. During the lockdown period, liquidity didn't matter because of the closure of the business activity. We need to cover temporary shortage of the revenue and income. However, as economic hardship continued, even after the lockdown period, then solvency, whether the these firms and the household can pay back what they borrow might increasingly matter. And what sort of measures can be taken against this problem? Uh, this table uh, I borrowed from the IMF blog, uh, and it's used to be so divided to these two categories here. And uh, I hope you can read it. Uh, but under the liquidity measure here, um, um, you can see that so tax and the social security contact contribution deferral or something like this purchase of commercial paper and bond, credit guarantees here, and liquidity provision for financial intermediary. In fact, that's almost all of these measures are listed in this so column uh, here have been implemented in Japan. As for the solvency measure on the right column here, you see that so cash transfer and uh, direct subsidy uh, here, direct subsidy based on past sales. In Japan, so we have already deployed these measures to some extent, and as well as this one, subsidy for maintaining employment. In light of the importance of preventing hysteresis effect associated with unemployment, which I will discuss later, I think it makes sense to take this measure proactive way. Whether we need to further take measure like equity injection here and here uh, uh, to the business and the financial sector depend on how the economy evolved evolve, and how quickly we have vaccine and or drug against COVID-19. Hopefully we can avoid that situation. As is in, as in the case of the financial crisis, admittedly, distinction between liquidity and solvency may not be that clear. However, from our experience of the financial crisis, I think it becomes clear that central bank can deal with a liquidity problem, but not a solvency one. After all, to end the crisis, uh, we need to, to have a solvency measure like public money injection which is in the hand of the government, but not the central bankers. And the second issue is whether we need to worry about inflation or deflation. Uh, because the COVID-19 shock has a char characteristics of both supply and demand shocks, it is difficult to judge how inflation reacts to, to the shock. On that score, as is often the case with economics, distinguished economists uh, seem to differ in their opinion. And economists like Oliver Blanchard here uh, argue that we should care about deflation, while veterans like Charles Gotthard tend to warn about inflationary risk. As far as price uh, development are concerned, uh, inflation seems to, to, to have moderated uh, at least so far. And each of the central banks uh, listed here, revised downward its original infl inflation forecast for year 2020 and 2021. Since Japan's inflation, uh, excluding food and energy, who was around 0%, I believe that so uh, we need to worry about deflation at least at the second stage. At the same time, given evidence that the Phillips curve has flattened, I also think that the inflation may not react much to the uh, change in the slack of the economy, as we saw at the time of the great financial crisis. And the third issue is importance of the raised potential growth uh, through improving, improving productivity. Among a number of economic analysis concerning effect of the COVID-19, one study caught my attention is a work done by Joder and others. As some of you may know, they also come back to the history of the European rate of asset returns since 14th century and find that so 
uh, these rates react on average like this so blue line uh, in this graph after the major uh, pandemic episode, including Black Death, because we go back to the 14th century. The rate declined by about 1.5% on average over the 20 years. And another 20 years are required uh, to come back to the original level. Since they use a trend component of these rates, sorry, this is a bit technical, technical, technical term, uh, they interpret that, so this graph as uh, the representation of the natural rate of interest, i.e. that so equilibrium interest rate, which balance saving and investment of the economy. So to repeat that, so this blue line shows that so natural rate of interest tend to go down after the pandemic like this. And why this happened? Uh, here, I put here that so their rationale, which essentially says that so precautionary motive increase saving but decrease investment, and that's the natural rate of interest declines. However, I think that the more straightforward explanation is that because people die at the time of the pandemic, and the labor input becomes scarce, and the capital input becomes relatively abundant, that makes its return diminish, I mean, the return to the capital uh, diminish. And using the same databases, uh, the also calculate the reaction of the natural rate of interest after the major war, which is red line uh, in this graph. It tend to go up rather than go down. This may be interpreted that so war kills lots of people, but destroys the capital at the same time. And because capital input becomes more scarce, its returns go up like this. Anyway, uh, we do not necessarily anticipate that the natural rate of interest will come down by 1.5 percent point over the 20 years. I know that so some other economists um, doubt the robustness of their finding. Um, besides, as we confirm at the outset, uh, this toll caused by the COVID-19 is more than the previous pandemic like Spanish influenza. This impl implies that the capital input uh, um, may become less abundant compared with those at the previous pandemic. That said, we need to, to worry about the situation. This is because the natural rate of interest of major economies are estimated have already declined to the very low level, like in the, on this left-hand side panel. At the same time, the potential growth, which is understood to move broadly in tandem with the natural rate of interest, is also estimated to have a decline. This reflects a secular stagnation hypothesis of summers. And COVID-19 may worsen this trend. Uh, this is particularly worrisome for central bankers uh, because the lower natural rate of interest means that the less doom for money bank, given the effective lower bound of the nominal interest rate. This includes two implications. First, we need to, to, to prevent potential growth from falling further. On that score, that so we need to, to, to take care about labor market condition. This is because once temporary unemployed continue to have a difficulty with finding a job, their human capital deteriorate and thus put downward pressure to the potential growth. Uh, this is known as hysteresis effect in the literature. For this reason, I think it makes quite sense that the government of the major economy have already taken some measures of supporting employment through subsidy as we saw as a solvency measures. Second, we need to raise productivity. COVID-19 has revealed how far we Japanese lag behind in terms of digitalization, both for the public and the private sectors. At the same time, it has also revealed that the importance of the flexibility of the labor market practice, which enable more efficient remote work. These are known as the long-term dues for Japanese economies. I hope the new government, after the Prime Minister Abe, will make double effort toward this direct, direct direction. I will stop here. Thank you very much. So much for fantastic overview on the Japanese economy facing the COVID toshi. Thank you very much. And uh, also, I thank you for active participation. You know, this is a good chance for you to ask the, your questions to the
to giants on the Japanese economy. So, oh, now I can start my video. Okay, so the, thank you so much. And uh, I would like to have our next speaker. So the next speaker is Sagiri. So Sagiri, are you ready? Yep, okay. Okay, please, please, please start. Thank you. Okay, so let me share the screen. Can you see it? Yeah, I can. Okay, thank you so much for uh, this great opportunity to present to such an uh, um, excellent audience. And I visited ANU about four years ago, and I had uh, such a fantastic experience uh, spending two weeks there. And uh, I always wanted to come back and participate, especially this uh, Japan update, which um, if they uh, kept talking about, but uh, you know, this time of the year, uh, it's usually really busy with kids going back to school. And uh, you know, one of the very few uh, silver linings of uh, this COVID crisis is that I can now, you know, freely participate in such an event uh, from home without uh, uh, too much hassle. So that's some, you know, good thing about COVID. So today um, I'm going to talk about the labor market and the inequality. So after this, uh, you know, excellent overview of, um, you know, the Japanese economy and the very distance um, in in the world by Sekine-san, uh, I'm I'm going to much uh, focus much uh, on the labor market issues in Japan. Right. Okay, so, uh, you know, the COVID-19 hit the uh, world economy and then destroyed uh, uh, almost uh, all the markets, including supply side and demand side of markets for goods, services, and labor. And then as we saw uh, in one of the Sikinesan chart, uh, there is a, a huge decline in the GDP, which went down by about 8% uh, quarter on quarter in the second quarter of 2020 in Japan. And I'm going to focus on the labor market and then also how, you know, this crisis uh, appears to change the inequality picture in Japan. So you probably have seen these headline numbers. So unemployment rate went up from 2.2% at the end of the year to 2.9%. That number, you know, may not look so, so big compared to a huge numbers in the US or other countries, but, uh, you know, still there's a big increase in the unemployment. And also, you know, as uh, sekine -san mentioned, uh, there was a big increase in the number of uh, employed but on leave so there are you know numbers behind and then there's a uh, you know number of employed which went up by uh, about 25 percent are uh, going up up to, uh, up to about 2 million individuals and then uh, uh, looking at the workers real wage went down by 2 percent year on year and then also work hours are going down by 5 percent so these are the you know big numbers that we are experiencing. But just looking at these numbers, it doesn't really really tell us you know how big is the impact and also the you know how this uh, you know negative effects are distributed across different types of people. So what I'm going to look at today is uh, you know. First of all, let's think about how unique this uh, COVID-19 crisis is relative to other recessions that we have um, uh, experienced in the past. So, you know, some people are more vulnerable to this uh, crisis than others. And then let's try to identify who are the people who are more vulnerable to this crisis. And for this, I'm going to look at the data that uh, um, uh, detailed uh, micro data that uh, we collect, uh, you know, the government collected before the COVID crisis. And then let's examine what actually happened during the last several decades since the uh, COVID crisis started. And then uh, after we identify shocks by looking carefully at the data, we're going to think about, you know, the welfare effects and how, you know, this crisis affected the different individual in terms of their consumption and also the welfare. And then after that, I'll talk about the policies in short run, medium term, and then also the long run. Okay, so today's talk is based on some of the uh, papers that I worked on with my uh, super co-authors. Um, most of the talk, uh, during, especially during the first part, uh, will be based on this first paper, which I worked on with the uh, Shinki Kuchi of MIT and then Minamo Mikoshiba of University of Tokyo. And then I also take some statistics out of my work, work uh, with Tomaki Yamada about the Japanese inequality. And then I may also talk about uh, some of the fiscal issues that we are facing, which is a joint work with uh, Selo Imo and then Tomoaki Yamada. So first of all, um, so in general, when there's a recession, who's going to suffer, right? So during the financial crisis or the collapse of the bubble, uh, what's going to happen to the labor market? So there's a shock to the economy, income goes down, so what would you do? I mean, uh, you, you're going to cut back the consumption, right? You may want to save more or maybe you can't even save, but 
you have to adjust the consumption. Uh, then you have to spend on food and clothes. That's something that's inevitable. But you may wait to you know, buy some uh, durables, maybe the cars or the furniture, and you may wait to buy a house. So typically, when there's a recession, workers in the manufacturing, construction, real estate, and of the you know, financial sector tend to suffer more than um, uh, workers in other sectors. So it's also called a man session because uh, men, men tend to, you know, populate these sectors more than female. And then also in Japan, you know, there are different types of workers and then contingent workers, I'm going to explain this a bit more carefully later, uh, tend to uh, suffer more from a recession. So they, are, uh, they have a job uh, under a more unstable contract compared to other types of workers. And then compared to these regular recessions, uh, what's special about this uh, COVID-19 crisis? So when there's a recession, what would the government do? The government tries to recover the economy, tries to stimulate economic activities and inter increase inter Actions, right? But uh, COVID-19 is totally opposite. We're going to have to suppress economic activities and then reduce the face-to-face -face uh, interactions because the source of the shock is coming from the infections which go, you know, from the personal interactions. So in terms of the industries that will be hit harder, uh, it's going to be very different from the general, re uh, general recession. So especially social uh, and also the face-to-face uh, -face industries uh, tend to suffer more like uh, uh, restaurants or tourism, those are the, you know, the industries that uh, uh, need to contract uh, to prevent the infections. And then also in terms of occupations, even if you're working for a, a hotel or a restaurant, if what you do is uh, you know, uh, checking the computers or working on the human resources, then you probably have, can continue you know, doing what you have been doing. So in terms of occupations, you know, there are occupations that are you know, hit harder uh, than others. Those are the ones that are hard to be done uh, or completed from home, or if the work uh, cannot be done remotely and lack of flexibility, then these occupations tend to suffer more than others. And also very unique about this uh, you know, crisis is that uh, it also hit a certain uh, you know, group of family structure and the gender. And uh, as in Japan and Australia, um, you know, almost everywhere in the world, the schools suddenly closed. And then there was a huge increase in the household and the childcare duties. And then that falls not on everybody, but you know, it falls more heavily on the uh, working couples. And then especially females uh, who tend to uh, undertake more you know, household duties. And then also in terms of employment status, if the firms have to shrink, they're going to cut uh, uh, workers and they do so um, you know, on, on workers that are easier to lay off. And then this is also the same as the regular recessions, but contingent workers uh, tend to be uh, suffering much more than the uh, regular workers. So let's look at the first, the, what are the economic conditions of these uh, vulnerable uh, people uh, who tend to suffer from this uh, uh, recession. So first of all, so I'm going to divide all the industries uh, into two groups. Okay, so first one is called the social industry, which include the retail trade, accommodations, eating, drinking, health services, educations. Those are the industries that need to shut down or shrink, you know, in order to control the infections. And then the other industries, I put them all in this uh, ordinary industry. And then in terms of occupations, I'm going to divide all the occupations into two groups. One is called a non-flexible occupation or no working from home occupations, which include the service workers, manufacturing process workers, carrying cleaning workers, construction and mining workers. And then the rest flexible occupations include the management, professional, clerical workers and so on. So I'm going to divide all workers into uh, two by two and a total of uh, four groups according to this industry and occupation uh, division based on the uh, pre-COVID-19 data. So this is the summary of the distribution and then also the earnings of each group. So we have an ordinary industry, social industry, and then flexible occupation and then non-flexible occupations. So people are uh, nearly uh, equally spread across different uh, cells. And then uh, the percentage uh, shows the, you know, the uh, fraction of workers uh, in each cell. And then the numbers at the bottom, 5.4, 5, 5 this is the average earnings of workers in each cell. So you can see that uh, there, there, there's a, a significant uh, difference in terms of their earnings and which ones are going to be hit harder by the COVID crisis. That's the workers uh, in the, this uh, fourth cell 
at the bottom right, the, those workers that are working in the social industry undertaking uh, non-flexible occupations. Okay, so those are the most vulnerable. So you can see that their average earnings before the COVID-19 crisis was 2.4 uh, million uh, Japanese yen, which is uh, you know the lowest among the four and uh, less than half of uh, what the, uh, the top uh, cell is making ordinary and flexible is making about 5.4. And then let's look more carefully um, at this uh, uh, distribution uh, looking by looking at the, this uh, uh, specification by employment type, gender, and also education. So let me say a few words, as I promised, about this unemployment type. So if I'm just talking to the Japanese audience, it's very uh, clear. So there's a very clear kind of definition is subtle, but there's a clear division in the labor market between the types of employment. So it's not like a full time and then part time division in terms of hours as you know people do in the US or other economies, but it's rather based on how workers are being called in the company. So the first group is called the regular workers. In Japanese, it's called the seiki koyo. And the second one is called the contingent workers, hiseiki koyo. It's also, you know, sometimes people call it uh, non-regular workers or irregular workers. So the regular workers included regular staff and the executives. And then these people are typically tenured. So they are on a lifetime employment. They, they are very seldom uh, laid off, you know, before they reach the retirement age. And then they are provided much more fringe benefits at work. And then they have almost guaranteed access to employment-based social security uh, system. So that's a big difference. So this, uh, you know, Japan has a comprehensive uh, pension, health insurance, and long-term care. And then if you're a regular worker, most likely you get this insurance through your employer. And then through em your employer uh, pays half of the contribution for you. But that's not for everyone. So if you're contingent workers, you're much less likely to have this uh, privilege. And then contingent workers include uh, various types of employment, part-time workers, temporary workers, or dispatched workers from an agency, and also contract workers, and all the other types of uh, you know, short-term workers. And they work typically on a limited term, and they get paid less, and the job is much more, uh, much more unstable. And then they're not always provided social security. So there's no clear like legal uh, separation or definition of uh, this uh, seiki koyo and this seiki koyo, but that's the definition. That that's the division that you really have to understand and, and know if you want to understand the you know labor market dynamics that we have seen over the last few decades and then how inequality is changing in terms of the earnings. That's a very important uh, uh, distinction. But just to give you an overview, so this is the, how you know, the number of contingent workers and regular workers changed uh, since 1980s. So the regular workers is going, is going up and down, but since 95, it's falling. And then contingent workers, uh, it's going up from 5 uh, million to uh, almost uh, 20 million by 2015. And then most of the rise is coming from the female participation. So female workers are participating by more, uh, more nowadays, and then most of them, you know, come to the labor force as a contingent worker. And then also there's an increase in the number of retirees who remain in the labor force. And many of them work as contingent workers. So, you know, sometimes you may hear that the contingent worker is a problem, but it's just the increase in the participation of female. But that's not always the case. So if you look at the picture carefully, the male uh, uh, percentage of uh, contingent workers is also rising, especially after 1990s. So it's going up from uh, less than 10% to 20%. So that, there's a huge um, increase in the number of contingent workers in the past few decades. And then if you look at the, our earnings, so let's go back to the two by two picture that I showed you before. So this is uh, looking at the uh, uh, workers by employment type and then also, sorry, uh, workers by the industry and then also occupation. And I'm going to look at the statistics statistics uh, for regular workers at the top and then the contingent workers at the bottom. So as you can see, uh, the average earnings is uh, much lower uh, in all cells from, uh, for their contingent workers compared to regular workers. And then if you look at the vulnerability uh, of these workers to the COVID-19 crisis, you can see that the contingent workers has much higher fraction of workers in this, uh, you know, most vulnerable cell. So if you're a contingent worker, uh, you're going to uh, be in this uh, bottom right cell with their one third uh, chance. And then if you're regular workers, you know, it's only 
uh, 14 percent and then your earnings are much lower uh, for, for the contingent workers and let's look at the same figure for by gender so male and the female and uh, female are more likely to be in this cell of uh, social industry and then non-flexible occupation and then let's also look at the picture uh, the sorry the tables by education so this is dividing workers by educational level. So the high skilled group includes uh, uh, workers with at least college degree. And uh, at the bottom, we have uh, low skilled workers with, uh, without the college degree. So if you have a college degree, your, your, your chance of being in this uh, you know, the, uh, vulnerable cell is uh, less than 10%, but, um, but that number goes up to 25% if you look at the uh, low skilled workers. So by looking at these pictures and the vulnerability is not spread equally across different uh, uh, people, uh, looking at the inequality in different dimensions, the vulnerability is much more concentrated always on the weak end of the income distribution. So let's check, you know, how the actual data uh, uh, evolved after the onset of the COVID crisis, especially in the second quarter of uh, this year. So for this, I use the official statistics labor force survey and the monthly labor survey in the first and the second quarter of 2020. Unfortunately, I don't have an access to the micro data or we don't have an access to the micro data. So we did um, uh, our best to identify the shocks by different uh, dimensions uh, by uh, examining the publicly available uh, statistics. Okay. And then once we identify these shocks, I'm going to feed these shocks into some simple economic model to evaluate uh, how bad the shocks are in terms of the welfare of uh, different individuals. So we're going to have to translate the shock number. So let's see, let's say there's a, um, uh, uh, my income goes down, my earnings go down by $1,000, right? And then we have to evaluate that in terms of how bad the shock is to me. Okay, so if my earnings is, uh, let's say, $2,000, and if, if it goes down by $1,000, that's a big shock, right? Most likely my earnings are uh, um, lower, and then my assets are going to deplete, be depleted, my consumption is going to go down. But if I have a million dollars of income and a huge amount of assets, I don't really care about that kind of shocks. So not just, you know, looking at the numbers, but we need some economic model to understand how bad it is in terms of our, our individual welfare. Okay, so for that purpose, I'm going to use uh, some, some, you know, very simple uh, standard life cycle model, uh, which include all the uh, heterogeneity that we care about, like in, in gender, education, occupation, industry, and then also employment types. So here's some data. So this is the change in employment uh, based on the labor, labor force survey. So on the left, uh, we have the number of um, employed for regular workers and the contingent workers starting in January all the way to June 2020. So the uh, COVID got worse uh, in, in uh, March of 2020 in Japan. And then after that, you can see that there's a huge decline in employment among the contingent workers that went down by about six, seven percentage point. And regular workers also went down, but the change is not comparable. And then on the right, uh, uh, we have the uh, change in employment by occupation and also industry. So there are four uh, types of workers and the green is the social and the non-flexible uh, workers that uh, are vulnerable to the COVID-19 shocks. So you can see that those are the workers that you know, lost by most. And then this is the picture by gender. So after April, uh, the female employment declined by much more than uh, male employment. And then, sorry, okay. So this is uh, another picture that show how employment's changed among regular workers and the contingent workers and also by age, right? So in this uh, uh, slide, I can show you uh, multi-dimensional pictures. So I'm just uh, uh, comparing the change uh, between the two quarters. So you can see that the contingent workers experienced uh, a big loss compared to regular workers. And then the loss is uh, much more concentrated among those in their 30s and 40s. So it's not um, equal. And then uh, let's now look at the uh, changes in the average earnings that we have seen over the last uh, uh, two quarters, last, last uh, five months here. So on the left, we have the change in earnings for regular workers. And then on the right, uh, we have the change in earnings of the contingent workers. And then it's comparing their um, earnings of the, in the social industry and then the ordinary industry. So regular workers' earnings, it went down, but the change is not that big. But if you look at the contingent workers' 
earnings, it declined by much more. And then especially uh, the change is large in the social industry. So that's the you know, summary of uh, uh, change in the data. And then now what we are going to do is to uh, evaluate this uh, change in terms of how bad the shock was uh, in terms of our welfare. Right, so we're going to quantify uh, the welfare effects of this um, change in the employment and the earnings in a small uh, economic model. Okay. So the way we are going to um, evaluate the welfare loss is in terms of the you know, change that we're going to have to make in terms of our consumption over the life cycle, the remaining life cycle. So let's say I'm hit by the COVID shock, and then that, if that shock is really bad, then I'm going to have to adjust my consumption. I'm going to change the consumption today a little bit, maybe tomorrow a little bit as well. And let's sum up the, you know, the drop in consumption that I'm going to sacrifice because of this COVID shock. And then I'm going to sum them up and then compute the present discounted value of this required change in consumption, and then express that change in terms of my you know, average earnings prior to the crisis. So that way we can evaluate evaluate how bad the shock was uh, for me in terms of the consumption that I really care about and then also express that as a relative size to my uh, earnings. If that number is, if the change in the consumption is big, um, maybe that's nothing relative to my earnings and then we don't have to care that much. So that's, uh, you know, kind of how uh, we, we should interpret this welfare number. So to make uh, that, to do the, this computation, we're going to have to make some assumption about how long the shock is going to last, because we all, all you know, we only have data for the last uh, uh, couple of months. So we may do on um, different scenarios, but in the baseline scenario that we're going to talk, I'm going to talk about. I'm just going to assume that the shocks are going to fade out in about a year on average. Okay, so. So let's look at the welfare loss of this uh, COVID-19 crisis in Japan. Uh, this is the picture, this is the uh, table uh, that summarized the result for the gender, right? So not surprisingly, females are gonna suffer my, by much more than males. Uh, so this is about four percentage point in terms of their earnings that uh, they're gonna have to sacrifice from the uh, COVID shock. And then uh, by employment type, there's a huge uh, difference between the regular workers and then contingent workers. So contingent workers lose by 8%, whereas the regular workers lose by 2%. And in terms of education, uh, low skilled workers with lower education level, they suffer by much more from this uh, crisis. And then also in terms of the occupation and the industries, uh, you can see that the workers in the social sector and then uh, engaged in the non-flexible occupations are gonna lose by much more uh, from this uh, crisis. Okay, so that's the um, uh, result from the economic model. Okay. So just to summarize, uh, so the vulnerability of the COVID shock, the shock is really bad, but uh, it's not, uh, uh, I'm not ending soon. <laughs> Do I still have time? <laughs> okay. So, yeah, don't uh, worry, don't worry. I, I just, <laughs> just a few more. The video. Just a so, few no, more no, please, slides. please go ahead. You, you have your time. Sorry. <laughs> okay. All right. So the vulnerability of this crisis is not at all spread equally across individuals. Of course, everybody has suffered, right? So I, I have to take care of my two, two, my two kids are staying at home at the same time as teaching uh, my regular courses and advising at home. So that's a huge suffering, but economically, I'm not hurt at all. So I have a job and I'm being paid, but some people are not. So there's a huge difference in terms of, you know, how the shock hit the economy and the different types of people. And then the early data that we have examined show that clearly, you know, it is hitting uh, people who are at the lower end of the income distribution. And then if you want to ask, you know, whether this shock has increased inequality, it appears that the answer is affirming, yes, it has increased inequality. It is um, increasing inequality, at least uh, in the short term. So if you want to identify and the name who is most damaged uh, from this COVID crisis from the early data, those are the uh, workers that are um, engaged in the contingent uh, jobs in the non-flexible job and in the social industry. So that's what the data tells us. So in terms of the policy, so um, if you by you know after we look at this data and then the result, um, you know who, who do you think the government should target? It clearly says that the government policy should be targeted to these affected households, and then the, desirably uh, the targeted transfers are so much better than the lump sum payment to everyone unconditionally. So you know, but that's not exactly what the government did. We did receive their unconditional lump sum transfer of about. A 
of thousand uh, dollars, right? So, you know, government could have done better if they had the information about who uh, they should reach. Of course, you know, this uh, uh, policy would require that the government has the timely access to individual data and then the ways to reach them, but they didn't. So that was the problem. But, um, you know, the data shows that the government should have done their best to reach uh, those uh, who were hit worst by this uh, shock. And uh, if uh, you know the government has a huge amount of asset and there's a fiscal uh, room, then they could have done this uh, lump sum transfer and then they can keep on doing that. But of course, as everybody knows, Japan is not in that situation, very limited fiscal room. And given the current spend, you know, fiscal situation that we are having, then the spending program, if they need to implement, should be at least considered carefully. Uh, at least to do the math, what is the cost of doing that, and what you know, what's the most efficient way to reach the most uh, needy uh, that needs to be done. And then in terms of um, you know how this shock is going to change the inequality in the long run or the medium term, that's very, very hard to say. First of all, we don't know how long it's gonna take for these infections to go under control. And then whether the economy is really gonna go back to where it used to be, that's also a big question. It takes a lot of time for the supply chains to recover, you know, supply chains to recover, and then demand may not come back to where we were. Okay, and then also, you know, um, I divided all the works based on the non flexibility and the socialness, but all these definitions are also changing. Like one year ago, I wouldn't have imagined that I'm teaching from, you know, from home and then giving a talk to all the Australian audience online, which is a luxury, but you know, that's uh, uh, something that's also changing. My kids are working hard from home uh, remotely, and then everything is uh, seems to be changing. And then especially, you know, the medical, uh, uh, the way that medical services services are provided is also changing. So that might give some, you know, good uh, uh, um, uh, change to the Japanese economy. So that's also something, you know, we have to uh, monitor in predicting how, you know, this shock is going to change the long run inequality. And then um, if there's a change in the industrial structure, then it also, you know, how inequality is going to change also depends on how workers are going to move to different jobs based on, you know, the need and also supply and uh, um, how the government is going to implement the policy and how individuals and the firms are going to respond will also affect how inequality is going to change. So um, there was a, a discussion about the current uh, policies in the previous uh, uh, presentation, but uh, in the medium term, if this, uh, you know, the situation is going to last, um, rather than providing assistance to the uh, people who uh, remain employed and on leave, maybe the government should, you know, at some point try to switch to encourage more job creations and then worker mobility and the recovery of individuals' capability to earn. As a Sikhnesan, uh, pointed out, you know, there's, um, if, the, if you keep just workers on leave, then their skills are going to depreciate. And then if, uh, you know, maybe, maybe they're, they're losing their skills uh, permanently if uh, the industry is not going to recover. So they would have to transition, you know, from subsidy to uh, employed temporary business closures or payments to workers on leave. But, you know, at some point, they're going to have to move to assisting uh, necessary closures or perhaps switches to new businesses or maybe provide some subsidies for job creations and uh, trainings. And then, um, you know, by uh, looking at the uh, changes in inequality, not just from this crisis, but also, you know, from the, you know, how labor market responded during the financial crisis and other uh, uh, shocks to the economy, um, you know, this really revealed that we're going to have to eliminate the gap between the regular and the contingent workers. And we're going to have to include the contingent workers into the same uh, common social security system. Those are precisely the workers that need more insurance provided by the government, but currently now are being excluded. So that's really important to include uh, them. And then there's also uh, a lot of uh, inefficient and outdated rules in the social security system. For for example, there's special exemptions on the social security contrib contribution uh, for dependent spouses earning below the thresholds. So that's something that um, you know should be also eliminated uh, in the long run. And then in terms of the fiscal situations as well, so existence of these uh, contingent workers who are making much less and then their uh, employment is uh, much unstable, that's really a time bomb 
for the Japanese government in thinking about the fiscal situations in the future. They have much lower savings, and then once they reach the retirement age, they have not, you know, contributed enough to the social security system. But people live long in Japan, so you know how uh, they're going to survive. The government would have to provide a huge amount of uh, uh, money uh, to sustain their lives. So that's also another, you know, uh, agenda that uh, we're going to have to work on. Okay, so that's it. Okay, thank you very much, Sagiri, for another fantastic presentation. You know, what the nice research, what the nice and the detail of the research. We need a, this type of the research to identify who are really, uh, you know, facing a difficulty under this COVID world. So the, please join me thanking uh, two speakers for fantastic presentation first. Then uh, now I would like to have a question. So still we are happy, we are happy to have a question. We don't charge you anything for asking a question. So if you have any question, please do so. And um, first, I found the names of my colleagues at the ANU. So the, the Ligan Son and the Warwick McKibben. Can you hear me? Oh, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. So please, please start your question. Um, thank you very much for a fantastic presentation. Um, my question was uh, for Toshi. And Toshi, thanks for taking over program directorship at Karma. It's great to have you on board. Um, my question was, um, uh, your estimates of what might happen to real interest rates in Japan is very similar to the working paper that I did with Roshan Fernando, where depending on the scenario, depending on number of waves and the policy responses in Japan, the real interest rate could fall between uh, 0.7 and, and 1.2, 1.4. So that's very consistent with your, um, your discussion. Um, what I think is really interesting is what might happen to productivity growth. We know that before the crisis, people were talking about the move towards singularity and that all this new technology was there, but no one was using it. Why haven't we seen high productivity growth? So it strikes me a plausible scenario is that this technology gets taken up in many different countries and you do get a surge in productivity in the future. Now that, that will drive up real interest rates, as you argue. Are you concerned that the increase in real interest rates may actually be bigger uh, than the increase in growth from the Japan's perspective. And therefore, you're in a very precarious situation because there's a trade-off between higher R and higher N. And that I think your prescription of high productivity growth policy in Japan is very important because even if you don't get the productivity surge and other countries do, world real interest rates will rise. And that is a situation you don't want to be in in the recovery phase. I appreciate your comments on that. Okay, may I? So, yeah, please. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. So, uh, for your great question, and uh, uh, and uh, um, I would say that so I don't have so quite clear answer to 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 to, to your question, in fact. But having said so, my so quick thought uh, uh, toward your question is something like this. That so, um, well, if we think that so. Uh, the, some technological progress is not really happening in other countries other than Japan. And, uh, and these countries' natural rate of interest is much higher than that in the Japan. So, so that is a kind of situation you, you are imagine uh, in your question. And, uh, and if that is the case, that's so, I would say that so, well, uh, if it's the case that so, and also that so, if that so, the, the, the Bank of Japan keep that so uh, interest rate quite low level, then uh, the, the presumably what would happen from is capital outflow from Japan. And, uh, and the presumably uh, people try to, to go out from this country, and, and which means that so, there's so, uh, exchange rate becomes weaker for, for the Japanese economy. And uh, and uh, I thought before that so that could be one scenario which might so cause so uh, the end of the deflation in Japan. But the reason why I did, I said that so I didn't have quite a good answer to, to that is well even though I imagine in the past something like this scenario, but it never happened in a sense. And uh, and uh, and because of the home bias, uh, which is I don't know why it happened. But but because of the stubbornness in the in the, the Japanese investor, uh, always we are talking about Mrs. Watanabe or something like that. There's nothing such sort of dramatic depreciation of the, the currency. 
uh, and and in fact that's what happened what in the past at least in the past is everything happened then Japanese yen appreciate rather than depreciate because of the safe haven currency or something like that and that part I don't have any specific so uh, the story behind it but but my so so brief answer to, to your question is if that's a natural rate of interest uh, going up to other country then I would say that so naturally we need to, to see that so some sort of the depreciation of the, the currency that must be some adjuster uh, between that so uh, country or, or or global economy. So that is that is from my side. Okay, well, is is it okay, or do you have any additional questions? No, it's just. A, I guess the key point here is how would capital markets adjust? Because in the end, you think the natural rate of interest would be the same around the world. Uh, so that's the way the world seems to be working. It's certainly been the experience over the last ten years. Real interest rates are low everywhere, uh, including in Japan. So that, that, that answered my question. Though. Thanks, Toshi. Okay, thank you very much, Regan. Are you ready or not? Not. Yeah. Okay. Uh, can you hear okay. me? Oh yeah, yeah, I can hear you now. Okay, Great. yeah. Th thank you so much for the uh, uh, Toshi uh, for your presentation. Uh, I like this very much. In uh, in one of the slides, you are seeing that there are three or uh, four stages, and uh, towards the end, you will call this the, the normalization, the stage on the normalization. I think it's a big issue and a big thing. We know that the COVID came ten years after the GFC, the global financial crisis. And in responding to that crisis, you know, Fed and other, you know, central European Central Bank and Japan also adopting those uh, the so-called unconventional monetary policy. And the Fed is someone uh, three or four years after GFC, they, they try to reverse and uh, that other policy because this is a very unprecedented implementing such an un unconventional policy. And then the COVID came, and when the COVID came, occurred, it, it doing the same thing again. So therefore. The normalization, in what sense? Uh, you, are you suggesting that you know to normalize the monetary policy? And the question is that how feasible, you know, not just Japan, but also including Europe, including the United States, to be able to unwind those uh, unconventional policy, moving towards some kind of a normal setting, and uh, uh, for the time being. And uh, so I thought it's uh, maybe very difficult if you are talking about uh, normalization of a monetary policy. <coughs> Thank you. Toshi, could you? Yeah, thank you very much for a great question again. And and uh, I would say that so the, I use that just as the, the the word of normalization of the policy. Uh, not necessarily mean that so uh, monetary policy. Of course, that's including a monetary policy, but also that's so fiscal policy as well. Mm. Um, um, because that's so as indicated in the slide. That's so uh, because of the COVID nineteen thing. That's so uh, because of the the the, 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 the fiscal side of the stimulus. Uh, which is uh, adequately taken, uh, and the debt burden is enormously. That is some sort of the subject that so, uh, Kitao Sensei mentioned as well. Um, and my sense here is it's going to take a very much long time to 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 to, to shrink shrink this so uh, government debt. As you know, that the Japanese government debt is already quite high level, but it goes mm -hmm. up further, and uh, and uh, and maybe it's going to take quite some time to, 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 to come down, first of all, to the, the much more moderate level, or still higher level, high level, but, but manageable level in a sense. Uh, yeah. so, so that's a, the, the process, uh, the first process for the normalization. Yeah. And, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, I would say that so, uh, because this fiscal side of the story, I don't have much specific so, uh, comment on that, but one of the things that so I am personally think makes sense is why we cannot create that so special account or extra account for the, 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 the government, so uh, the balance sheet, uh, mm -hmm. like we did in, as, after the great so as, earthquake, uh, great East, East Japan earthquake, uh, we made that special account and, uh, and, uh, and because of his fiscal so, uh, burden was enormous at the time, and we paid them gradually from the special account. And maybe this might be the case again. Then why we cannot make that sort of special account for the, the COVID-19 things? And uh, and as Kitao Sensei mentioned, that so since we have dispersed lots of money across the board, 
and why we cannot so get back some money from the, the wealthy guys uh, and uh, and presumably you, we can ut utilize that so income tax or something like that rather than consumption tax in order to close the gap for for the the the, the, the this special account so uh, debt burden so so that's the number one thing but even though it's going to take quite a lot of time and during that time presumably uh, unless we observe that so inflation is quite rapidly going up, then presumably the, 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 the central bank need to, to keep the interest rate quite low. And it's gonna take another many so long time. Uh, I don't know how much, how long it's gonna take. But after we see that so some sort of so fiscal side of the, 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 the economy is becoming a little bit much better shape, then I think that so we need to, to think about that. So uh, why we cannot normalize monetary policy. Yeah. That would be yeah. quite a long process. Uh, so that's so what I mean. Uh, that's the fourth uh, stage. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so that. Okay, so while the panelists are answering uh, two questions, we have uh, twelve more questions. So that let me speed up the, the the process. So that let me read the question. So that I have an interesting question from Motoko Rich. You know, hello. I have a question regarding the most vulnerable category of the workers. Kitao Sensei, you identify women in social, non-flexible jobs. How many women are in, are in those types of jobs by choice, as opposed to having an uh, accommodate their husband to brutal work hours? Yeah. In other words, women go into these jobs because they have to take care of the housework and the child care and they can't commit to full-time regular jobs. So that, uh, Sagiri, could you answer to this question? Sure. Yeah, that's a great question. I don't have the answer to that. I mean, I want to ask, uh, you know, those uh, a lot of women on, in their contingent jobs, um, if they really want to, uh, you know, land in a job that is uh, regular. But I think uh, there is uh, no uh, such uh, option once you go to the contingent job. So if you look at the mobility between the contingent job and then uh, and in the regular job, um, there's almost a, a very, very small uh, probability of going from contingent jobs to regular jobs. And then also, as I mentioned, there are lots of uh, regulations that essentially is a huge tax on uh, female workers to go back to regular jobs or even the uh, uh, contingent jobs. So there's a certain threshold above which uh, uh, you're going to be no longer dependent on your husband and that uh, contributing to the social security system. The threshold right now is about 1.3 uh, million Japanese yen. So unless uh, your earnings go above that threshold, you're going to be dependent and then you're going to be exempted uh, from making any contribution to the social security system and then receive the, um, um, you know, all the benefits. And then that kind of you know, system is extremely inefficient and then excluding a lot of women from uh, participating in the labor force. And then I, I talked to politicians. Some people are also asking uh, whether our kind of research is really changing their uh, policy or how we are affecting uh, the actual policies. And then politicians seem to you know, recognize that it's such an inefficient. And it's also inconsistent with the, uh, you know, with what the government seems to be trying to do. They're trying to encourage more women to work, more older people People to participate, there are, but there are so many, um, you know, small uh, inefficient uh, uh, regulations that are embedded in the current social security system. So those are the things that can be removed, and then see uh, how women are going to respond to the change, and then that may partly answer your questions. But since there are so many, uh, on, you know, all the different factors, including the rules, it's very hard to tell, you know, whether the women working in these contingent jobs are really happy or not. Okay, thank you very much. So I have, uh, again, uh, so many questions. Um, you know, it, it's great to have a lot of questions. And uh, I, th this is a question to, to panelists, so that maybe I would like to combine it together about the, 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 the debt sustainability. Okay, so that I have a question from Lydia. I'm interested in knowing more about the potential reforms that Japan is considering to improve the public pension system particularly in light of the predictive increase in social security spending. May not be that much to do with the COVID, but the you know, COVID situation definitely makes the budget situation worse. And I have a question from Alex. Could the panelists talk about the Japan's debt issue? How serious do they consider it to be? And how should it be dealt with? So that, so that if you would like to start, Toshio Sagiri. 
Okay, maybe the, the Toshi, can I, can I ask you yeah, this? Uh, let me just, well, because um, sustainable debt sustainability is a kind of subject that Kitao sensei is much more so, uh, so professional. Uh, because I'm just a central banker. So <laughs> anyhow, uh, um, that situation is quite serious, as you know, and uh, and that sustainability is always uh, the issue. But having said so, uh, um, well, so far that's so, lucky enough, we don't have seen that so that sort of thing happen uh, in Japan as yet. Uh, and uh, and I think that so one of the issue is definitely related with uh, the 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 the. the the, the question here is raised as so social security system. Uh, that is a kind of so huge so source of the, 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 the government deficit uh, in, 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 in Japan. And uh, definitely there is quite a so big need to, 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 to reform uh, uh, not only the social, not only the, the pension, but also, so, so also the health insurance or this kind of thing as well. Uh, to, to cope with that, so the, the, the demographic factors. And one of the things which I mentioned before uh, is, well, just think about it. So Japanese become biologically, become much more younger than before. Why we cannot so uh, increase much more flexibly, uh, raise that so retirement age or these kind of things, uh, and just try to, 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 to defer that so uh, the timing of the, the pension payment to the extent possible in line with the biological health in the Japanese so uh, elderly. Uh, that is uh, one thing. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, definitely that is a kind of thing that so, uh, we need to, to, to have in Japan. So that's my answer. Yeah, sorry, before the Sagi and uh, I got a similar question from a green door if I pronounce correctly. So that, I was wondering whether the Japanese economic recovery funding will add more debt, which already at the staggering number at the moment. Could you tell us if there are any fiscal rule that the discipline Japanese debt policy? Thank you. So it's a related question. So that Sagiri, could you? Sorry, I'm not summarizing in a nice way, but I just asking you to answer everything. But uh, could you do so? Okay. Uh, can I share one slide that I had? Uh, you, you can see it. See it? Yeah, I'm. I'm I can, okay. I can, I can uh, so this is one of my backup slides. <laughs> I, was, uh, I was expecting that somebody may ask that question. So this is uh, some predictions about the government deficits that I had computed uh, based on uh, pre-COVID uh, data. So this is uh, not including the debt that we would uh, increase, but in, we would have, we would, we will be increasing, uh, it, you know, and have by the end of the year. So you can see that, you know, uh, in here, I'm just assuming that um, the current system is not going to change at all. And then just using the predictions about the Japanese populations. And uh, as sakine san correctly uh, said, you know, it's not just about the pension, but also the health insurance, long-term care, and then the interest payment. Here, I'm just assuming that the interest rate is going to remain at 1% in real terms. So pretty, maybe pretty uh, optimistic assumption so it's it's a huge issue that we are facing and then how can we solve this uh, problem I don't think we are seriously facing this problem either and uh, um, you know some, sometimes government hear that so this is a percentage of expenditure divided by GDP so that this uh, increase in the deficits is going to be wiped, wiped away if you can increase the denominator Right, so GDP goes up if there's a miracle uh, increase in the productivity and the output, then we can, you know, be happy. But that's not something that we have seen over the last few decades. So we cannot uh, and should not uh, keep dreaming about this uh, uh, growth miracle to happen. So we have to face this. And uh, it's a very tough question. I don't have the solution. But one you know, uh, thing that we should uh, look at is uh, uh, where's the room to increase in terms of the GDP and then also the contribution to this system. I would say that uh, you know, reducing the pension, it's, it's you know, something that we should think about. But it's very difficult, almost impossible to talk about as a politician. I mean, the, uh, all the people don't like the idea. And then uh, uh, they don't. Who, who's going to vote? It's the old people in Japan. So it's very hard to think about that. So we have to think about how we can do, what we can do about the denominator. So we did, uh, I, I have a paper with uh, my co-author, Minamo Mikoshiba, uh, how the female participation can change uh, this picture. So the more in, you know, encouraging participation is really important. 
But if you just increase the number of female workers without changing how they contribute to the labor you know, market, it's not going to change the fixture at all. So just increasing the number of participation, like uh, uh, what happened during the past decades that uh, Prime Minister seems to be very proud of, that's a great achievement. But you, know, it, you have to look at uh, what uh, women are doing, as some people asked before. So if you can also change how productive and how you know, uh, much uh, each woman can contribute and the way they uh, be, they are included in the social security system, making them contribute, making, um, you know, uh, let them uh, accumulate enough human capital um, as a male do, then that's going to change the picture. So that's one thing that uh, I think uh, we should uh, uh, consider. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. So I have uh, two questions from Stuart Nixon. The first one is uh, maybe for Toshi. So the, he thinks the stage, stage two could last uh, longer. Oh, sorry, I, I, it's, okay, stage two could last a long time. So the, what role do you see for measures such as safe operating procedures, uh, programs to encourage digitalization and policy that uh, reallocate uh, resources away from pandemic incompatible activities rather than lock in a status quo. So that's maybe the question to Toshi. And the second question is, uh, is, is to Sagiri. So he's wondering if emergency service workers, healthcare professionals, and a police fire ambulance are included in a social and non-flexible. And uh, then uh, whether the difference would be even greater if these were excluded. So that, could you answer to these questions? So the first, Toshi, could you answer the, maybe the changes in the social norm and uh, maybe the policy to encourage that, how it's effective? Could you, could you answer, Toshi? Yeah, uh, well, first of all, I totally agree with that. So the, 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 this stage two could be much long lasting uh, uh, than what so we hoped, in a sense. Uh, at this stage, at least, that so um, it's gonna be taking. Well, who knows that's when that so this vaccine or this kind of thing can be fully deployed. Uh, although that so there's, there's a lot of media talk here and there. Um, so, but in in a sense that so uh, during that period, that so uh, one of the things that so I mentioned is uh, we need to to to, to sustain the economy uh, by taking care of the solvency issue, this kind of thing. But at the same time, so what I'd like you to, to mention here is also that so we need to, to think about that, so uh, how to, to reallocate resources uh, by uh, something uh, here, but but not to to, sh to that that's not that's not necessarily mean that so um, the bad guy need to go out immediately something like this. Uh, well, that is a kind of thing that so people might always talk about that. So, hey, we need to, to encourage zombie companies should go out. And in order to do that, we need to raise the interest rate now. Uh, something like this, that sort of line of that the argument is sometimes I've heard. But uh, I think that so it's a kind of so uh, 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 bad idea in a sense. Uh, whenever we see that so the, the unemployment is so becoming higher, then we given that so labor mobility is not such great, then I would say that so that's sort of so uh, the, 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 the uh, get closure to, to the, the zombie company would be not kind of an issue that so at the stage two as yet. Uh, we hope that so we can do it after that so uh, stage three or stage four. Uh, but at the stage two, what we can do is put much more, I mean, it's positive sense that so whenever we see that so this industry or this company uh, seem to be much more have potential, then why we cannot so get the money to, to these guys. Uh, so, so that's the kind of thing that we might be able to think about, but not to, 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 uh, to, to uh, intentionally to, to close down the, the, the bad guys. So that is not the issue of the stage two. So that's my reaction. Thank you. Thank you very much. So that, okay, before asking the, the, the Sagiri to answer to the second question, but I found that another related question to the first one. So it's coming from Kentaro Asai. I'm expecting some positive shocks because of that. Oh, oh it's moving. So, oh, no, no. So, it's moving, sorry. Because of the transition from the traditional Japanese working style to the one utilizing remote and virtual communications. 
which should save a lot of time for workers. If any, could you please kindly share your view with us in terms of long-term structural impact on the supply side of the economy? So that, Sagiri, could you first answer to this question? And, uh, and then uh, I would like to ask you to answer to the question about the uh, inequality impact to the social and uh, yeah, non-flexible workers. Yeah. Um, I, I'm not sure if I got the first question correctly, but it's, it's talking about the, the question about the essential workers. It, it, it's yeah. hard to tell, you know, the economic conditions of essential workers. So it includes, uh, you know, doctors who tend to be paid more, and then also, you know, those workers who are, you know, in the in the uh, working in the in the grocery stores, for example, which remained open. So we, at some point, we uh, excluded, we, we made a third category of essential workers, but uh, that didn't really influence uh, the uh, picture that uh, and the, the main message that I had. So. You know, I, I don't have a clear answer to that unless I look at the, look at the data once more. And then uh, another question about the teleworking and then maybe some positive uh, uh, side about uh, increased uh, job flexibility uh, that uh, may remain, you know, much more permanent after the COVID crisis. Yeah, that, that's uh, yeah, some hope that we can um, expect. I think uh, there's a study by uh, Michelle Trotilde and Matthias Stofke who look at the, you know, how the female uh, labor force participation is going to change after the crisis, looking at the U.S. data. So it's, it, you know, if this flexibility of uh, work is going to remain even after the COVID crisis, that most likely is going to work more favorably for uh, women who need, uh, you know, more flexibility and the balancing a life at work and uh, also at home. So hopefully that's going to change, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, how especially women contributes to the labor force, but that remains to be seen, really. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. And I had a similar question from Christina Magnus Hawkins. So that I think, uh, yeah, so it's already answered. So that I would like to go to the question from Yalin Aksevin. I hope I'm uh, pronouncing correctly. So that I have a question about, I have a question to the panelists. So that I have a question about the process of recovery after the pandemic. Right now, it appears that the general mood about the government the competency about handling the COVID-19 pandemic in Japan is largely, largely in the negative side. Do the panelists see this, this, last, this, last, this, this illusion meant trans, translating into negative attitude about the ability of the government to restart the Japanese economy after the crisis? And if so, how would that harm the process of recovery? So it's maybe a general question about uh, people's trust on the government policy and that given such circumstances, what the government can do. So that, a tough question, but I'm sorry, as a former boss, can I ask Toshi to answer this question? Yeah, this is a, uh, well, I, well, if I were still the, the Bank of Japan guy, I never respond to that sort of question, but still uh, I'm, I'm not so the, the, that sort of burden as anymore, so, so uh, well, let me just so, um, do, uh, um, well, let me just respond to, to, to this kind of so difficult question that I must say. Well, I would say that so, yeah, in a sense that so people feel quite a disappointment or sorry feeling uh, regarding how the government handled uh, uh, the COVID-19 thing, which might be not necessary that so uh, reflecting fairness or something like this, but 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 people feel that so well the government so measure is not so on in time or something. So so that sort of thing is atoms for there. I don't deny it. And 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 I think that so uh, well uh, if that is the case, then why uh, the new prime minister uh, can. Uh, expose this opportunity in a sense. So new leader just coming into the, 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 the new the picture, then he might uh, be able to, to say that, so I want to, 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 to change the process a more rapid way. And, uh, and I want to, 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 to utilize more digital technology or this kind of thing. And so that is a kind of so good opportunity for, for the, the government to change that, so, uh, the, the atmosphere of the, the, the general power. I know that so it is quite difficult, uh, but but presumably uh, if that's a great statement or politician are there, uh, is selected, I hope that to the prime minister, then 
uh, he might be able to do it. So that's my uh, uh, presumably uh, optimistic uh, reaction to the question. Thank you very much. And uh, maybe the, I would like to have a, a Sagiri's answers, but uh, maybe the, it's a, maybe the, I have a question related to, to more to the Sagiri's field. So the, what the initiatives government is considering to help the economy recover and the, in the process help create more employment. So this is about the government policy. Can you think about uh, any effective government policy to promote uh, more employment or do you have some idea the government is already trying to implement the uh, policy to increase the uh, employment? I don't think um, the government is focused on creating more jobs or starting up a new business that might be more needed um, under this, uh, under or you know, during or after the COVID-19. They are much more focused on keeping the firms alive and then workers um, in the current jobs. And that these policies are good as long as you know this pandemic is not gonna last more than a few months and then the economy is gonna go back to where it was. So it's just a temporary thing that we're gonna have to wait. But at some point, we're gonna have to make a judgment if the changes that we are seeing may be more permanent. In that case, you know, rather than keeping the same industries or the workers in the same jobs, they may you know, switch their gear and then make the transition to new jobs or you know, facilitate more mobility uh, of workers from a particular industry to another industry. So that's something easier said than that. I mean, uh, if there's a technology uh, development and then there's, a, you know, for example, like in the U.S., there's a polarization going on and then the middle class is tanking, then why don't they just move and then they should, the government should make a, 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 a provider, you know, the training to move. But that's very hard to do. So, you know, during the transition, probably the government would have to do the both things to keep the workers, you know, um, um, uh, uh, life uh, and providing maybe unemployment insurance or the current style of subsidies but at the same time you know they should also switch to more proactive um, uh, uh, policies to uh, you know stimulate uh, job creation and uh, new industries but that's something that we have not seen i think okay thank you very much so that okay so we are a bit running out of time but i hope could you toshi and Sagiri, could you stay a little bit longer Although we can pay anything to you, but uh, I hope you could, uh, yeah. If you say no, that's not a good, good, uh, you know, image for you. So I hope you could stay a little bit longer. So uh, then uh, I'd like to go to the next question. So that my question is, uh, Professor Kitao, does COVID-19 have any impact on immigration or foreign employment policy and the situation in Japan? I heard that the Japan has attracted the many foreigners to work recent years in preparation for the Tokyo Olympics. I think if Japan can hold the Tokyo Olympics successfully, will it be a great help to the job market? So that, could you answer to this question? Okay, so I have not seen the recent data about the foreigners inflow and outflow, so I cannot uh, answer to that question. But uh, given the shortage that we are going to face, not just now, but you know, over the coming decades, uh, we're gonna have to you know, rely on and count on foreigners, that's my opinion. But how they're gonna be integrated in the Japanese labor market, that's a, a, a big issue. So there's a huge concern about you know, if there are more foreigners, especially in the lower skilled uh, uh, industries or occupations they may crowd out the Japanese workers and then change the wage structure and then exacerbate the inequality so that's something that we're gonna have to uh, keep um, uh, watching but uh, given the huge decline in the labor force that we are destined to experience um, I think uh, you know we should uh, uh, be more proactive in attracting uh, you know foreign workers into the labor force not just in terms of the economics, of course, but there are other things that, um, good things that we're gonna have to consider. Thank you very much. And uh, this may be a question to Toshi. I think uh, we already covered uh, this question, but uh, this is a little bit more specific. Could the panelists please talk about the impact of COVID-19 on e-commerce? Are we seeing a shift in a business, particularly a small med SMEs to digitalize and go online? Will e-commerce be an important factor in Japanese economic recovery? I'm sorry, maybe you must maybe answering already have answered some question, but uh, do you have any specific answer to that question? Toshi, please. Yeah, definitely. So presumably one of the things that so we need, we can anticipate it. So presumably because of this kind of so, uh, thing happened, uh, well, e-commerce uh, can be 
much more ex so be used uh, in 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 day by day business. Although that so there is some study that so uh, after the COVID nineteen that so uh, not elderly people come into this so uh, uh, e commerce world. Uh, rather than that, youngsters just come into to 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 utilize more uh, in a sense. Uh, so 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 how long are we going to sustain is still questionable as yet. But I think that so the direction is quite clear that so uh, presumably uh, Japanese youth was much more so this e-commerce or this kind of thing. And I think that this is a part of the story that so uh, productivity uh, should, will come up uh, by exploiting that so this digitalization of the new technology or this kind of thing uh, uh, because we are still lag behind uh, peer country. So, so that's that's my response. Thank you very much. And um, okay, so I have a question from David Law. So the, a question for Kitao San. So you mentioned the need to eliminate the gap between the employment arrangement for regular and the contingent workers. How should this happen? Oh, moving. So how should this happen? By regularizing the arrangement for contingent workers or making regular workers arrangement more flexible. Also, how likely is this sort of a reform to occur? Another tough question, so, but um, if you could answer as much as you can, please. Uh, that's a great question. Uh, the government, I think, is uh, looking in that direction, but there are so many things that you're going to have to overcome. For example, the regular workers, um, typically they get the job right after the college graduation, and then they're going to remain uh, employed in the same company until they retire. Right? So the job uh, change frequency is very low. It's good for those people who landed in these uh, safe jobs, but you know, if not, then uh, uh, you have the scar for the entire life because of uh, lack of the mobility between the, you know, the regular work and the uh, uh, contingent job. So for example, for those people who, got the, who graduated from college during uh, you know, 1990s or you know, before 2000, when the economy was uh, tanking, uh, their scar is set to not remain. So those people who are in their 40s or 50s, they still suffer from uh, this, uh, you know, the uh, bad luck they had when they graduated. So this should not be repeated, you know, after the, this uh, COVID. So those people who graduated last year probably have the totally different picture uh, from the ones who are going to graduate this year. So the government, you know, I think recognize that, but uh, we need to have more proactive action to increase the mobility. For example, maybe they can implement a policy so that they're not going to ask the age or even gender uh, when hiring the workers. It's, you know, easier to say that uh, we should increase the mobility, but there needs to be some proactive actions to, um, you know, implement that. Thank you very much. And then um, I would like to go to the question by Jenny Corbett. So that, you know, our friend, old friend, Toshi and myself. So the question is, so this is a question to you both, but uh, more, maybe the more, more, more to Sagiri. So is Japan's inequality still relatively low by international standards? We all feel intuitively that the more inequality is bad, but we also don't expect to eliminate it completely so there is a question about what it, what, what it is appropriate for policy to do in normal times and in the crisis times. Do you have a view about whether Japanese policy was addressing inequality appropriately in the absence of COVID? Also, do you have an explanation why Abe changed the policy from what would have been appropriately targeted to lump sum? We know it is political, but uh, what would the political objectives of those who push the lump sum so that okay that's a big question but uh okay so i would like to maybe the, the question is whether you know in a normal time japan should eliminate eliminate the inequality more and uh, what could be done particularly in the crisis time as of now so maybe sagiri would like to go first uh, sure. Yeah, now uh, that's a great question. I wish I had a clear answer for that. But the inequality is something that you cannot ignore. Like inequality causes political instability that we have verified everywhere across different uh, uh, countries. So politicians are paying much more attention to inequality. Like even in the monetary policy, like Jackson Hole, I think uh, there was a lot of discussion about the inequality. So that's something that uh, you know the government cannot uh, um, uh, ignore. And then uh, I guess um, you know up until um, maybe. Uh, 
several years ago, the government did not pay much attention uh, to you know what's going on in inequality, but rather much more focused on the aggregate numbers and growth. But nowadays, I think it's 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 changing, and uh, um, it's a, it's a threat to the fiscal situation as well. If you just leave this inequality, you know, people who are in their 40s and the 50s, there's a huge increase in inequality over the last few decades within these cohorts. And then once they reach the retirement age, that's going to they're going to pose a you know huge fiscal burden and then if you have to raise taxes that's going to you know shrink the macro economy so that's something that's going coming on, on in in the next uh, you know maybe 10 years or 20 years if you just leave it as it is, as is so that's uh, you know what the, uh, i think government um, must uh, pay attention to thank you toshi do you want to add some something uh, i would Oh, well, first of all, Jenny says, thank you very much for this great question. And uh, I would say that so, um, um, well, maybe what you smell, uh, what you try to mention is something like this that so, uh, presumably, in case of Japan, uh, in court, because of lower inequality, is coming from the top guys' payment of the, the salary payment or some sort of incentive or this kind of thing is much lower than uh, other country. And, uh, and if you try to, to go back to this, uh, this top 1% of top, top 0.1% income thing, then Japan's uh, is really uh, egalitarian community. And, uh, and I would say that so, well, presumably we need to focus in quality issue regarding what Kitao sensei mentioned that so, for instance, that so female workers who know to pay adequate of the way, she must be single mother, that sort of thing. It's definitely we need to, 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 to have raise that sort, so that sort of people to go up to the ladder. But at the same time, we need to a little bit think about that in the Japanese society, that so why we cannot so go up to the ladder. I mean, that's a talented guy can get much more higher some way. And 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 that gonna be incentivized, incentive that so the the, the 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 some sort of so much more innovative activity or this kind of thing. So so on that score, that's so presumably uh, there must be something that so well not so simply say that so inequality is bad thing, but rather than that, presumably we need to do of course that so uh, the sustain the, the people uh, lives uh, and to, to try to, to, to make these guys uh, send the, the very so uh, normal life. But at the same time, presumably we, we might a little bit think about that so flexibility regarding that so top guys can go up a little bit more. So so that is a kind of thing that so we might be able to think. But I don't know that so which kind of government measure can do it because this might be much more cultural uh, thing. Uh, might be there as well. So that's that's my reaction. Thank you so much. And uh, we are answering almost all, uh, the kind of that almost cover all the questions except the two. So I'd like to ask uh, last two questions. So first is that Malcolm, who is in London, and um, he sadly needed to cancel the travel to Japan. So that, you know, I, I'd like to answer to his question. So that he mentions, you know, what has been the impact on the Japanese tourism industry? And what are your thoughts about this in the short and the long term. Maybe, Toshi, could you answer first? Your view about the tourism industry, it's, it's really difficult to predict at the moment, but uh, if you have some view, it, it would be great if you could share with us. Well, I think that so, this is a typical story of the solvency issue. That so, well, uh, the tourist industry now has a great difficulty uh, because of that so, there is no inbound tourists uh, in, in coming to, to Japan. Uh, so, so there's a quite big so uh, problem there, and uh, and uh, presumably government can sustain uh, some of these guys, uh, and uh, and uh, well try to, to to save these kind of people, uh, and uh, and uh, if there is some some sort of solvency issue, these people might be uh, saved for, for for to some extent. I would say uh, this is because that so well after all. We hope that so stage three is coming in the future. Then presumably at that time, this inbound tourist or this kind of thing is coming back as well uh, again. So as I mentioned before, that so we don't know how long we're going to take, but at least that so we can hope that. Then why we cannot sustain uh, this industry to the extent possible? So that's my my reaction. 
Thank you very much. Do you, do you have something to add, Sagiri, to this question? Um, no. Uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. So then I'm, I'd like, to, I'm sorry, I cannot cover all the questions, but I'd like to have this as a last question, final question. So that that's coming from the Lachilan pit. I hope I'm pronouncing correctly. So thank you both Toshi and Asagri so much for the talk. Are there any actions or even discussions taking place regarding a targeting of fiscal stimulus to the groups that need it the most? Not just the money, but the perhaps something like a subsidizing or completely funding training or education, which would help individuals in these groups move into more stable and the less vulnerable jobs. So that maybe this is maybe the question to be answered by Sagiri. Could you could you answer? Uh, sure. Yeah. So it's a great question, similar to somebody uh, the question that somebody else asked. So that's you know data clearly tells that's really the action that the government should take. But uh, I guess the big question is how the government can clearly identify uh, who uh, they should help and then how much transfer they should give and then how to reach them. So you know one of the things that really was revealed uh, from this COVID crisis is that government lacks information about individuals. They don't even have uh, you know correct information about how much people are making last year and then how things changed uh, uh, this year. So that was you know something that uh, the government could uh, uh, improve in accessing. I mean there's also a trade-off between the you know the efficiency and uh, also privacy. But even if you sacrifice uh, some privacy that's something that uh, you know the government has to seriously working on as some people were asking some people were asking you know the new government seems to be more eager to work on these digital issues which i hope will include you know collecting uh, uh, right information about the economic conditions of different people so once they have that information that's definitely the policy that uh, uh, should be taken but uh, for now i i don't think uh, the government has a clear um, at least as far as I know, a plan to make transfers uh, to, you know, these uh, people. But for some industries, for example, the tourism uh, is the most uh, uh, badly hit by this crisis. And then they implemented some policy to give some subsidy uh, to make, uh, you know, the tours to different hotels and, uh, uh, you know, the tourist places. But, you know, that happened uh, when the uh, infection, number of infection was rising. So that policy was also very much criticized. But that kind of policy might be effective um, if they could identify, you know, which sector is, uh, you know, more damaged you know, more, more hardly hit and then I, they, they have a way to target the people uh, that would be great but at this moment I don't think they have a way to uh, reach the most uh, needed in a very, very efficient way. Okay thank you very much so we have a more question and I'm sorry I cannot handle all the questions and um, maybe my handling the questions is, is incomplete I'm sorry for that and it's, so, it's really difficult to to check the questions in a, in a smaller window. So this is just an excuse. But uh, I hope you, you learned a lot from two experts on the Japanese economy. So, that, and, um, so this time it's virtual, but in the future, I want to have uh, Toshi and Asagiri together uh, physically in Canberra to present that uh, Japan update, the very near future, maybe uh, next year or maybe in two years. I hope the thing is, is getting better. So that, and uh, th first of all, thank you very much uh, for for participants to 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 to, in to be involved in active discussions. And uh, last but not least, uh, please please join me thanking two fantastic you know panelists. You know you understand uh, what I said at the beginning is 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 true. You know they are truly distinguished, uh, fantastic, and the best speakers for for this Japan update. So that. Please join me thanking uh, Toshi and uh, Sagiri for fantastic presentation and discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Chip Day and all the organizers. <laughs> I really enjoyed it. <laughs> Thank you for all the questions. It was great. <laughs> Thank you very much.